I assure you that I am the book of fate. Questions are my enemies, for my questions explode. Answers leap up like a frightened flock blackening the sky of my inescapable memories. Not one answer, not one suffices. What prisms flash when I enter the terrible field of my past? I am a chip of shattered flint, enclosed in a box. The box gyrates and quakes. I am tossed about in a storm of mysteries. And when the box opens, I return to this presence like a stranger in a primitive land. Slowly, slowly, I say, I relearn my name. But that is not to know myself. This person of my name, this Leto who is the second of that calling, finds other voices in his mind, other names and other places. Oh, I promise you, as I have been promised, that I answer to but a single name. If you say Leto, I respond. Sufferance makes this true. Sufferance and one thing more. I hold the threads. All of them are mine. Let me but imagine a topic, say, men who have died by the sword, and I have them in all their gore, every image intact, every moan, every grimace. Joys of motherhood, I think, and the birthing beds are mine, serial baby smiles, and the sweet cooings of new generations. The first walkings of the toddlers, and the first victories of youths brought forth for me to share. They tumble one upon another until I can see little else but sameness and repetition. Keep it all intact, I warn myself. Who can deny the value of such experiences, the worth of learning through which I view each new instant? Ah, but it's the past. Don't you understand? It's only the past. This morning I was born in a yurt at the edge of a horse plain in a land of a planet that no longer exists. Tomorrow I will be born somewhere else, in another place. I have not yet chosen. This morning, though, ah, this life. When my eyes had learned to focus, I looked out at sunshine on trampled grass, and I saw vigorous people going about the sweet activities of their lives. Where, oh where, has all of that vigor gone? The God Emperor Leto II, The Stolen Journals. But it's like a balloon. The surface of the balloon is their face, with what we do not know. Inside the balloon, as we blow into it, is what we have proved. But as we increase what we think we know, we increase our exposure to what we do not know. This is one of the inevitable laws of our universe. But isn't it more interesting to live in a universe where there are unknowns to discover, new lands to explore, than to live in an absolute box where when you find the edge, no place to go from there. I like the fact that we cannot predict everything. I like the fact that we live in a universe where anything may happen because the alternative to me is a constricting dead end. God Emperor of Dune is the fourth book in Frank Herbert's Dune Saga. The novel takes place 3,500 years after the events of the previous novel in the series, Children of Dune. Leto II of House Atreides has ruled the Empire with an iron fist since that time. The sand trout skin, which Leto had first put on in Shulok, has grown and changed him. In the early stages of Leto's transformation, which is referred to in the novels as his metamorphosis, Leto was mostly human. The symbiote skin had given him incredibly amplified strength, immunity to conventional attacks, and prevented him from aging. But Leto always knew what would become of him eventually. 
The skin, which was not his own, consisted of many interlocking tiny sand vectors. Leto knew that approximately 4,000 years after he had put on the living suit, the completed transformation of the sand trout into their adult worm phase would destroy him. Leto calls this his final metamorphosis. I often think about my final metamorphosis, that likeness of death. I know the way it must come, but I do not know the moment or the players. This is one thing I cannot know. I only know whether the golden path continues or ends. The golden path is Leto's grand plan for humanity. It is a path that his father, Paul Atreides, saw, but rejected. In the time that the God Emperor of Dune takes place, Leto and the Sand Trout Cilia have become one body. Leto is a pre-worm, seven meters long and two meters in diameter. His body weighs approximately five tons and is carried around by the Royal Cart, a technology created by the Ixians, one of the fringe worlds on the outskirts of the Empire who maintain rule over their home planet through technocracy. Leto's body is ribbed down its length. Only his face remains. It is at the height it would be had he a man's body. Though his arms and hands were still functional and seemingly human, his legs had atrophied and become useless long ago. Mostly Leto was in control of the pre-worm body, but there are also reflexes beyond his control. The pre-worm body, for instance, would react to protect itself if threatened. The God Emperor maintained supreme control over the universe. Arrakis is now a wet planet, fully terraformed, with clouds, lakes, and rivers and forest. The great worms of Arrakis died out long ago, and no more spice is being produced. Leto kept his hoard of spice well hidden. No one truly knew how much he possessed. The Spacing Guild's dependency on spice made them almost reliable as allies. No one moved in the universe without the permission of the God Emperor. All spice in the universe was rationed by the God Emperor himself, and he could deny rations to those who displeased him. Much of the novel God Emperor of Dune is told from the perspective of Leto II. By use of an Ixian device called a Dictatal, Leto can cast his thoughts in a particular mode and have the words printed out on Redulian crystal sheets. One Redulian crystal sheet is a mere molecule in thickness. Leto could then have them copied onto less permanent material. God Emperor of Dune opens sometime in the distant future, as the God Emperor's journals, which were discovered long after his death, are being read and studied for historical insight. These journals are a completion to the legendary documents known as Leto's Stolen Journals, which were stolen from the Citadel on Arrakis during his reign as God Emperor. The plot begins as Siona Atreides escapes with the Stolen Journals, two books printed on crystal paper. Siona is highly important to Leto, the most recent result of his breeding program, which he had snatched from the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood over 3,000 years ago. As Siona and her party escapes with the God Emperor's journals, Leto's D-Wolves are unleashed upon them. They had stolen the journals from the fortress in the Sarir. Siona and her two accomplices are pursued by the creatures through Leto's forbidden forest. Ulat dies first, as one of the wolves violently rips out his shoulder, and the rest of the pack pounces. The D-Wolves were allowed to eat anything they caught in the forbidden forest. But the D-Wolves did not stop to eat. They knew that two more humans ran through the forest. The second to die was Kuteg, whose ancestor had served at Siege Tabor back in the days when Arrakis was still called Dune. Siona had been the fastest, which is why she had been holding the packet containing the stolen journals. They had known the risk would be great, but they knew that the secret of where Leto hoarded his spice would be worth it. Kuteng had sacrificed himself, delaying the D-Wolves to help Siona escape with the journals. Once Siona escapes the forest and crosses the Idaho River, the wolves do not cross it. They had been conditioned to stop at the water, to know the boundaries of their territories. Siona had escaped with two of Leto's journals, items of immeasurable value. 
Siona knows that the people of the Imperium have no true lives of their own. The populace lived in neat rectangular houses, with flat black roofs, constant sameness, and this was repeated on every planet in the Worm God's empire. Even planetary capitals, she said, were nothing more than large villages, of the kind found everywhere in the empire. Even though even the poorest families are well fed, their daily lives grow more and more static with the passage of time. Siona admires the ancient Fremen because they were truly free. In the Worm's empire, you went only where the Worm demanded. According to the God Emperor, this was for the sake of Leto's peace. But Siona had spied on the God Emperor and her father Maneo as a child, and what she had heard had planted a seed of hatred for Leto in her mind. He says he denies us most crises, to limit our forming forces. He said, people can be sustained by affliction, but I am the affliction now. Gods can become afflictions. Those were his words, Duncan. The worm is a sickness. Siona Atreides despises the worm god, and vows that she will be his end. In Siona's mind, Leto has no right to call himself God, no right to impose his tyranny upon the universe. She is certain that the information in his journals will be enough to undo him. Siona calls the Worm's empire a prison. I will destroy you, Leto. Not we will destroy you. That was not Siona's way. She would do it herself. She turned and strode toward the orchards beyond the river's mold border. As she walked, she repeated her oath, adding to it aloud the old Fremen formula, which terminated in her full name. Siona ibon fed asiifa atreides it is who curses you, Leto. You will pay in full. Leto finds Siona fascinating. He had not predicted that she would take the journals. This gave him great pleasure. He had watched her in the Forbidden Forest by use of his devices. He could have stopped the D-Wolves at any time but chose not to, calling them an extension of his purpose. His purpose to be the greatest predator that mankind has ever known. Throughout the millennia, Leto II has had the Tleilax suit produce countless Duncan Idaho Golas. Leto used Duncan Idaho Golas as his commander of the Royal Guard. He also used them in his breeding program occasionally. The Duncans always trended towards subversion, however, but this was precisely the reason that the Duncans were used. At the start of the novel, Leto's current Duncan, who has served him in the past 60 years, attempts to kill him after discovering that the Tleilaxu are working on his replacement. He knows that Leto II has vowed not to use his prescient power to predict the moment of his own death, and he believes that a Lazgon can kill him. The Duncan concealing the weapon which Leto already knows about, having been informed by the guild, had come to talk to Leto about Siona and her rebellion. This bores the god emperor. He recognizes predictable patterns in the rebellious. All rebellions are ordinary and an ultimate bore. They are copied out of the same pattern, one much like another. The driving force is adrenaline addiction and the desire to gain personal power. All rebels are closet aristocrats. That's why I can convert them so easily. Why do the Duncans never really hear me when I tell them about this? The God Emperor insists that radicals always see the world in binary terms. Simple, us versus them, or good versus evil. In addressing more complex issues this way, these radicals create a window into chaos. The God Emperor states that government is the mastery of chaos, which, contrary to the belief of many, has predictable characteristics. Leto says that radicals only create new radicals, continuing the old process. A radical that saw the complexities, however, was in fact no true radical, but a rival for leadership and must either be killed or co-opted. Duncan, I am all of them, and I know. There has never truly been a selfless rebel, just hypocrites, Conscious hypocrites or unconscious hypocrites, it's all the same. Lost in thought, and bored of the talk of rebels, Leto does not initially notice the Laiscon that the Duncan has pointed directly at him. You, Duncan? Have you betrayed me too? Eh, too brute? Every fiber of Leto's awareness came to full alert. He could feel his body twitching, 
the worm flesh had a will of its own. Idaho spoke with derision. Tell me, Leto, how many times must I pay the debt of loyalty? Leto recognized the inner question. How many of me have there been? The Duncans always wanted to know this. Every Duncan asked it, and no answer satisfied. They doubted. In his saddest Muad'Dib voice, Leto asked, Do you take no pride in my admiration, Duncan? Haven't you ever wondered what it is about you that makes me desire you as my constant companion through the centuries? You know me to be the ultimate fool. Duncan! The voice of an angry Muad'Dib could always be counted on to shatter Idaho. Despite the fact that Idaho knew no Bene Gesserit had ever mastered the powers of voice as Leto had mastered them, it was predictable that he would dance to this one voice. The laser gun wavered in his hand. That was enough. Leto was off the cart in a hurtling roll. Idaho had never seen him leave the cart this way, had not even suspected it could happen. For Leto, there were only two requirements, a real threat which the worm body could sense, and the release of that body. The rest was automatic, and the speed of it always astonished even Leto. The laser gun was a major concern. It could scratch him badly, but few understood the abilities of the pre-worm body to deal with heat. Leto struck Idaho while rolling, and the laser gun was deflected as it was fired. One of the useless flippers which had been Leto's legs and feet sent a shocking burst of sensations crashing into his awareness. For an instant, there was only pain, but the worm body was free to act, and reflexes ignited a violent paroxysm of flopping. Leto heard bones cracking. The laser gun was thrown far across the floor of the crypt by a spasmodic jerk of Idaho's hand. Rolling off of Idaho, Leto poised himself for a renewed attack, but there was no need. The injured flipper still sent pain signals and he sensed that the tip of the flipper had been burned away. The sand trout skin already sealed the wound. The pain had eased to an ugly throbbing. Idaho stirred. There could be little doubt that he had been mortally injured. His chest was visibly crushed. There was obvious agony when he tried to breathe. But he opened his eyes and stared up at Leto. The persistence of these mortal possessions, Leto thought. Siona, Idaho gasped. Leto saw the life leave him then. This was not the first time a Duncan had died by Leto's hands. In truth, only 19 Duncans had died by natural causes. After the Duncan dies, Leto wonders if Siona and Duncan could have been mates, but he dismisses the idea. But Leto does note, however, that the Duncan had been aiming for his brain. His brain was no longer a brain of human dimensions, not even associated with his face. It had spread throughout his body. This was a fact he had told only to his journals. Inwardly, Leto possessed a vantage point by which to view his ancestral memories without fear of being overcome. He could reach back and gaze through the eyes of any person in those memories. In this way, he was unlike anyone who had ever lived before him, even his sister Ganima. He had mastered his inner lives and could speak with the voices of his ancestors. Though his power is great, it causes him to struggle with unbearable boredom, having seen the near extent of all human potential. Leto said that to be thought of as a god, as he was, became ultimately boring. The stolen journals state that holy boredom is a good and sufficient enough reason for the invention of free will. This is key in understanding the role that Leto intends for Siona in his golden path. Leto's rule of the universe was maintained by his fish speaker legions. The fish speakers were Leto's military force during his reign as god emperor of the Imperium. Finding that the Fremen and the Sardaukar were unable to suit his needs, Leto II founded his all-female army. The fish speakers maintained garrisons on every planet throughout the Imperium. According to the god emperor, male militaries were ultimately predatory and would eventually turn against the civilian population in times of peace when there was no enemy to fight. Females, on the other hand, would remain calm and tame during peacetime. Fish Beaker schools could be found in the festival city on Arrakis. Leto had given them the name Fish Speakers because according to his genetic memory, the first priestesses spoke to fish in their dreams. Leto said this was of great value. 
The fish speakers were extremely loyal followers of the god emperor's religion. They reacted violently to anything they considered to be heresy against their one true god. The fish speakers were the enforcers of Leto's peace, which was necessary for the golden path. In terms of longevity and the number of planets ruled, the fish speakers can be thought of as the most effective military force of all time. Men were almost completely shut out of the fish speaker combat forces. The only role that men served in the lives of fish speaker women was that of husbands. Fish speakers were trained to be extremely effective, disciplined, and even fanatical soldiers. Leto, however, rejected the idea that fish speakers should be thought of as a police force. By my name, I assure you that is not so. Police are inevitably corrupted. Police always observe that criminals prosper. It takes a pretty dull policeman to miss the fact that the position of authority is the most prosperous criminal position available. The fish speakers could not be corrupted. The fish speakers were more than an army. The women also served as the god emperor's governmental bureaucracy. They were activists, courtiers, pages, teachers. Fish speaker priestesses served as judge and jury and executioner. The fish speakers also served roles as assassins and secret agents, and any other use that the god emperor saw fit. A fish speaker would fall upon her own blade without hesitation if Leto commanded it. Nela is the most prominent fish speaker in the Dune series. Nela was a large hulking figure. Her strength was legendary. The god emperor himself had once seen her lift a hundred kilo man with one hand. She has been commanded to obey Siona Atreides in all things by Leto II, even though Siona plots to destroy the god emperor. This is a cause of great internal conflict for Nela, but she trusts in the will of God. The god emperor had also implanted technology of Ixian manufacture inside of Nela's head, which would allow him to speak directly to her if he wished. Nela wonders whether there may be a computer inside, but dismisses the thought, for it was God who put it there. Nela reported on all of Siona's actions to the god emperor. Her faith in him was unquestionable. Even if Siona sends you to kill me, you must obey. She must never learn that you serve me. No one can kill you, Lord. But you must obey Siona. Of course, Lord. That is your command. You must obey her in all things. I will do it, Lord. Nela's faith was such that even Leto himself could not shake her. Any obstacle she viewed as a test. This religion built around my purse and disgust me. Yes, Lord. Nela's green eyes on the gilded cushions of her cheeks stared out at him without questioning without comprehension, without the need of either response. If I sent her out to collect the stars, she would go and she would attempt it. She thinks I am testing her again. I do believe she could anger me. This damnable religion should end with me, Leto shouted. Why should I want to loose a religion upon my people? Religions wrecked from within, empires and individuals alike, it's all the same. Yes, Lord. Religions create radicals and fanatics like you. Thank you, Lord. The short-lived pseudo-rage sank back out of sight into the depths of his memories. Nothing denied the hard surface of Nela's faith. Nela is the perfect example of pure fanaticism. Siona Atreides is the descendant of Ganima Atreides and Hak Aladar, once known as Feridin Carino. Siona's intelligence and charisma has helped her to become a leader of a group of like-minded rebels. They are determined to end the rule of the God Emperor. She plans to give copies of Leto's journals to groups whose loyalty to the God Emperor is questionable, including the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, the Guild, and the Ixians. Siona does not find the location of Leto's spice hoard, but she does discover something else. Siona shows Nela a flower and a strand of hair which she found pressed in between two pages of paper. On the paper read, A strand of Ganima's hair with a starflower blossom which she once brought me. On another page was written, Words I wrote when told of Ghani's death. The sand beach, as gray as a dead cheek. A green tide flow reflects cloud ripples. I stand on the dark wet edge. Cold foam cleanses my toes. I smell driftwood smoke. 
Siona knew that with these words they had discovered the key to God's undoing. The God Emperor loved his sister. Yes, he is capable of love. Oh yes, we have him now. Maneo Atreides is Siona's father and the closest and most loyal servant to the God Emperor. Maneo acted as major domo of Leto's household. The God Emperor thinks to himself what a gift Maneo has given him and his daughter Siona, knowing that she is the new, while he himself is a collection of the old and obsolete, a crypt of ancestral knowledge, a relic. Siona was more important to Leto than she or Moneo knew. Siona had the ability to vanish from Leto's prescient vision at times, though she was not aware. She would fade, and yet the golden path would remain. But Siona, in fact, was not prescient herself. She was unique. Siona had the potential, if she survived Leto's test, that is, to be the one who could offer humanity a clean slate, the ultimate goal of Leto's breeding program, someone who could hide from the prescient view and spread those genes throughout all mankind. Moneo, in his youth, had been a rebel just as Siona is now. In fact, most of Leto's trusted administrators had once been rebels. According to Leto, rebels made for the best administrators, and all rebels were closet aristocrats, which was why he was able to convert them so easily. Later, seemingly in contradiction to this statement, Leto says that in order to identify rebels, he looks for men with principles. Principles, he said, are what we fight for. Most men go through a lifetime unchallenged, except at the final moment. They have so few unfriendly arenas in which to test themselves. They have you, she said. But I am so powerful, he said. I am the equivalent of suicide. Who would seek certain death? Madmen or desperate ones, rebels. I am their equivalent to war, he said, the ultimate predator. I am the cohesive force which shatters them. Leto says that a good administrator is incorruptible, shrewd, philosophical, and open about their errors, and quick to see decisions. The difference between a good administrator and a bad administrator is the fact that a good administrator can make immediate choices, act on instinct. A bad administrator hesitates eventually acting in ways that create serious problems. Moneo is concerned for his daughter's safety, but makes sure that the God Emperor knows that his own concerns are paramount. Moneo knows that Siona is dangerous and has placed a spy amongst her, which Leto already knows. Siona provides Leto with surprise due to her ability to hide from his prescience, but she also reminds Leto of what he fears most of all the sameness and repetition that could potentially destroy the golden path. Siona is the contrast by which I know my deepest fears. Maneo's concern for me is well grounded. I tell you this, in the hope that it will help you understand why I act as I do in the full knowledge that great forces accumulate in my empire with but one wish, to destroy me. You who read these words may know full well what actually happened, but I doubt that you understand it. Though the manipulation of human genetics is forbidden by Leto's religion, the Tleilaxu know how much he treasures his Duncans. They reproduce Golas from the original cells from the original Duncan, who died all the way back in the Dune days. Thus, the Duncans all have the memories up until that original point of death. The Tleilaxu do this in the hopes that it will buy them favor with the God Emperor. It does not. In the opening of God Emperor of Dune, a new Duncan awakes to a strange new world, finding the planet Arrakis to be unrecognizable, and the shape of the Empire to be completely different to how he remembered it. He is a man out of his time. I am Duncan Idaho. That was about all he wanted to know for sure. He did not like the Tleilaxu explanations, their stories. But then, the Tleilaxu had always been feared, disbelieved, and feared. The new Idaho, sometime after the death of his predecessor, is escorted down to the planet Arrakis by Tleilaxu face dancers, who make a game out of changing their faces constantly to confuse him. 
They then tell him that the women of the Royal Guard will come for him soon. They leave him there, in a dull, featureless room. Idaho is confused by their statement since he is not aware of Leto's all-female army. He is aware that he is a Gola. He remembered his own death and could not deny the truth. Initially upon awakening, he had been a blank slate, there to be programmed in any way the Tleilaxu wished. They unblocked his memory by repeating the scenario which awoke hate's memory in Children of Doom, by conditioning him to kill a man so similar to Paul that Duncan believed that it was likely a Gola, though he wonders where the dirty Tleilaxu would have gotten the cells of Paul Atreides. The god Emperor Leto assures Duncan that it was no more than a face dancer mimic. Whilst among the Tleilaxu, Duncan is allowed to study Tleilaxu history. He learns of Leto II, who was born 3500 years ago and yet still lives as ruler of the universe. But this second Leto, so the history said, had become something. Something so strange that Idaho despaired of understanding the transformation. How could a human slowly turn into a sandworm? How could any thinking creature live more than 3,000 years? Not even the wildest projections of the geriatric spice allowed such a lifespan. Duncan doesn't know what to believe. He suspects Tleilaxu lies. It wouldn't be until he saw the worm god Emperor that he would truly believe. The Tleilaxu tell Duncan that the god Emperor is a tyrant and had ordered them to produce him from their axolotl tanks. They do not know what became of the one before him. The presence of the new Gola pleased the shadow of Paul Atreides which lived within Leto. Leto had the new Duncan brought into a dark room, where he could hear Leto speak before he saw his form. What do I call you? It was the sign of acceptance for which Leto had been waiting. Will Lord Leto do? Yes, my lord. Idaho stared directly into Leto's fremen blue eyes. Is it true what your fish speakers say? You have memories of... We are all here, Duncan. Leto spoke in the voice of his paternal grandfather. Then, even the women are here, Duncan. It was the voice of Jessica, Leto's paternal grandmother. You knew them well, Leto said. And they know you. When the lights turned on, Duncan saw Leto's body and he asked why Leto had done this to himself. Leto told him that he would know in time. He told the Duncan that eventually his body would make sandworms of some sort, but they would be aware, having more ganglia, more nerve cells. Though Duncan begins to accept that Leto is a Atreides, he can still sense that something key is missing. Something has been stolen from humankind. You've taken something away from us, he said. I can feel it. Those women, Maneo. Us against you, Leto thought. The Duncans always choose the human side. Idaho returned his attention to Leto's face. What have you given us in exchange? Throughout the Empire, Leto's peace. Leto tells Duncan that his so-called peace is actually enforced tranquility, that the fish speakers are present because humans by nature react negatively against tranquility. He gives them this and a hierarchy, which they can easily identify. A hierarchy where he is God, though he tells Duncan that in truth, holiness is a curse and that it offends him. But Leto understands that it is necessary for the Golden Path, which is a fact that the Duncan cannot yet comprehend. Leto tells the Duncan that his duty will be to guard him by any means necessary and also to guard his secret. The secret that he is in fact vulnerable that he is not truly God in the ultimate sense. Duncan still doesn't fully trust Leto, and tells him that he will turn against him if he should discover him to be worse than the Harkonnens. Ultimately, Duncan agrees to serve Leto, after the God Emperor reminds him who he truly is. When we climb Siege Tabor for the last time together, you had my loyalty then, and I had yours. Nothing of that has really changed. That was your father. That was me! Paul Muad'Dib's voice of command coming from Leto's bulk always shocked the Golas. Idaho whispered, All of you, in that one body. He broke off. Leto remained silent. This was the decision moment. Presently, 
Idaho permitted himself that devil-may-care grin for which he had been so well known. Then I will speak to First Leto, and to Paul, the ones who know me best. Use me well, for I did love you. The Duncan leaves the god emperor then, not knowing that his words had disturbed him. Leto knew that in fact, it was love that he was most vulnerable to. The Bene Gesserit Sisterhood remains unbroken during the reign of the god emperor. Leto mentions that out of all in the universe, the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mothers are the most like him, having access to their ancestral memories. The Bene Gesserit as always make their plots, he is aware of most of their efforts. Early on in the novel they attempt to form an alliance between the fish speakers and themselves, but fail. The fish speakers keep nothing from God. You Bene Gesserit assail me on all sides. Even now you seek to suborn my fish speakers. Sister Chinaue says that she steeled herself for death, but the God Emperor merely stopped his cart and looked across her at his entourage. She says the others stopped and waited on the road in well-trained passivity, all of them at a respectful distance. The Lord Leto said, There is my little multitude, and they tell me everything. Do not deny my accusation. Sister Chenoway said, I do not deny it. Leto commands Chenoway to report his words back to the sisterhood exactly. He is fully aware of her special training as an oral recorder and of her true mission on Arrakis. He tells her that he will restore the outward view, the spiritual freedom that humanity had lost. Humans had been enclosed, trapped behind latches and locks, and most humans were not strong enough to seek freedom within themselves. He tells the Sisterhood that as they succeeded in creating the Kwisatz Haderach, he has succeeded in creating Siona, though he does not elaborate for the Sisterhood. The Bene Gesserit wonder about the God Emperor's reference to Siona and intend to investigate. Sister Chenoue had also been commanded by the God Emperor to withhold certain words from her report to the Sisterhood. When Chenoue asked Leto about his likeness to a reverend mother, he responded by telling her that he and his sister were awakened in the womb. He told her that because he knows that she had been told to record accurately whatever she heard, that he would speak to her as though he was speaking to one of his journals. He told her to preserve the words well, for he did not want them lost. When she asked him why he had chosen her, he said it was because he would never see her again. She did not understand his strange words. The Lord Leto spoke as follows. To my certain knowledge, when I am no longer consciously present here among you, when I am here only as a fearsome creature of the desert, many people will look back upon me as a tyrant. Fair enough. I have been tyrannical. A tyrant not fully human, not insane, merely a tyrant. But even ordinary tyrants have motives and feelings beyond those usually assigned to them by facile historians, and they will think of me as a great tyrant. Thus, my feelings and motives are a legacy I would preserve lest history distort them too much. History has a way of magnifying some characteristics while it discards others. People will try to understand me and frame me in their words. They will seek truth. But the truth always carries the ambiguity of the words used to express it. You will not understand me. The harder you try, the more remote I will become, until finally I vanish into eternal myth, a living god at last. That's it, you see. I am not a leader, nor even a guide. A god. Remember that. I am quite different from leaders and guides. Gods need take no responsibility for anything except Genesis. Gods accept everything and thus accept nothing. Gods must be identifiable and yet remain anonymous. Gods do not need a spirit world. My spirits dwell within me, answerable to my slightest summons. I share with you because it pleases me to do so. What I have learned about them and through them. They are my truth. Beware of the truth, gentle sister. Although much sought after, truth can be dangerous to the seeker. Myths and reassuring lies are much easier to find and believe. 
If you find a truth, even a temporary one, it can demand that you make painful changes, conceal your truth within words. Natural ambiguity will protect you then. Words are much easier to absorb than the sharp Delphic stabs of wordless portent. With words, you can cry out in the chorus, Why didn't someone warn me? But I did warn you. I warned you by example, not with words. There are inevitably more than enough words. You record them in your marvelous memory even now. And someday my journals will be discovered. More words. I warn you that you read my words at your peril. The wordless movement of terrible events lies just below their surface. Be deaf. You do not need to hear or hearing. You do not need to remember. How soothing it is to forget. And how dangerous. Words such as mine have long been recognized for their mysterious power. There is secret knowledge here which can be used to rule the forgetful. My truths are the substance of myths and lies which tyrants have always counted on to maneuver the masses for selfish design. You see, I share it all with you. Even the greatest mystery of all time. The mystery by which I compose my life. I reveal it to you in words. The only past which endures lies wordlessly within you. He tells her that he preserves these words for the future generations of mankind, who will seek to unravel the mysteries of his rule to find meaning in their own existence. Chinoe got the sense from Leto's words that he was uttering some kind of last testament. She asks the god emperor if he is telling her this because he is about to die. Leto laughs. No, gentle sister. It is you who will die. You will not live to be a reverend mother. Do not be saddened by this. For by your presence here today, by carrying my message back to the sisterhood, by preserving my secret words as well, you will achieve a far greater status. You become here an integral part of my myth. Our distant cousins will pray to you for intercession with me. Leto has seen Chinoe's death in his prescient vision, and tells her so. In that moment, the Bene Gesserit sister Chinoe and the Lord Leto share something almost physical, a mutual experience of wordless truth. Chinoe is unable to describe it. This account was found amongst Chinoe's papers after her death. She died in the 53rd year of her sisterhood, when she underwent the spice agony in an attempt to convert the deadly truthsayer drug and become a reverend mother. The God Emperor completely denies the Sisterhood any involvement in his breeding program. The fish speaker garrisons on the Bene Gesserit homeworld kill the children of the Sisterhood who result from genetic lines which they object to. As a result, the Sisterhood struggles to maintain their level of reverend mothers. When the Sisterhood protested this to the God Emperor, he responded with a warning. Be thankful for what you have. The Sisterhood understood. The Sisterhood does not question Leto's prescient abilities, and know him to be more powerful than any before him. They believe that he knows every important action that they will take prior to the event, and therefore guide themselves by the rule that they will never knowingly threaten his person or his grand plan, which they can discern parts of. The Sisterhood's official address to the God Emperor is as follows. Tell us if we threaten you, that we may desist and tell us of your grand plan, that we may help. The Sisterhood is also aware that the Guild and the Ixians work together to develop a mechanical substitute to the prescient power of a navigator. The Sisterhood does not suspect that much will come of this, though they are watchful. The success of the project could mean the reduction of the God Emperor's power in the universe, since Spice would no longer be required for safe space travel. The God Emperor has many devices of Ixian manufacture. Many of them defy the proscriptions of the Butlerian Jihad, containing thinking machines. Early on in his reign, Leto had revealed to the Ixians that he knew the secret location of their Ixian core, the heartland of their technological federation. He had seen the location in his prescience. The technology of the Ixians is feared throughout the Empire. 
Only once have the Ixians attempted to trick him with a violent device. He had killed the entire delegation before the package was even opened. In the novel, the Ixians send a new ambassador to the court of the God Emperor, Wei Nori. Shortly after her arrival on the planet, she meets with the God Emperor, and just as the Ixians have planned, Leto is immediately attracted to her. Her uncle Malki had once been boon companion to the Lord Leto. He knew the God Emperor better than perhaps even Moneo. The God Emperor finds both her physical beauty and her truly pure personality to be intoxicating. Leto understands that the Ixians have uncovered his secret, his vulnerability. Leto had known that they had been working on something. He couldn't see it, but he knew when something vanished from his prescient view. Hui Nori had been raised in a no chamber, a device that the Ixians had developed from the same technology that he used to record his journals. A no chamber hid whatever was inside from prescience. Hui Nori had been bred specifically to appeal to the final remnants of humanity within Leto. He has become more and more alien with the passage of time. He longed to feel again. The Ixians hoped that they could use Hui Nori to tempt Leto away from his golden path. Hui was merely a pawn and meant Leto no harm consciously. Leto could not bring himself to dismiss Hui Nori and he could not kill her. The Ixian plot had worked. Leto decides instead that she will be his bride. The God Emperor is incapable of physical intimacy. The sand vectors of his body reacted to even the slightest hints of moisture. He tells Wee Nori that she would be allowed to take a lover if she so chose. She accepts the God Emperor's proposal. We are myth killers, you and I, Moneo. That is the dream we share. I show you from a god's Olympian perch that government is a shared myth. When the myth dies, the government dies. Leto's golden path, if successful, will lead to a new way of existing for humankind. Leto knew that governments were only useful to the governed as long as the government's inherent tendencies towards tyranny were restrained. I can imagine your inward travels, Lord. No, you cannot. I have seen peoples and planets in such numbers that they lose meaning even in imagination. Oh, the landscapes I have passed, the calligraphy of alien roads glimpsed from space and imprinted upon my innermost sight. The eroded sculpture of canyons and cliffs and galaxies has imprinted upon me the certain knowledge that I am moat. Not you, Lord. Certainly not you. Less than moat. I have seen people and their fruitless societies in such repetitive posturings that their nonsense fills me with boredom. Do you hear? I did not mean to anger you, my lord. Moneo speaks meekly. You do not anger me. Sometimes you irritate me. That is the extent of it. You cannot imagine what I have seen. Caliphs and Majids, Rakas and Rajas and Bashars, kings and emperors, primitives and presidents. I have seen them all. Feudal chieftains. Everyone. Everyone a little pharaoh. The Gan Emperor understood that governments always trended towards increasingly despotic states. Humans naturally sought out tribal hierarchies, filling an ancient demand for a system in which every individual knows his place. Leto believed that knowing one's place was valuable, even if that place was temporary. But to be held in place against your will was another thing entirely. Leto had imposed this stillness upon the entire universe. Such was his tyranny. But this was his lesson to all mankind. Beware of the liberties you offer up to your leaders. Even though you read these words after a passage of eons, my tyranny shall not be forgotten. My golden path assures this. Knowing my message, I expect you to be exceedingly careful about the powers you delegate to any government. Moneo had been the God Emperor's major domo for the past 79 years. He was truly the God Emperor's creature. Moneo somewhat resented Duncan Idaho Golas because of the special connection they shared with Leto, their mutual memories from the Dune days and before. As I said before, Moneo had once been a rebel just as his daughter Siona is now. As a gift to Moneo, Leto takes Siona out of harm's way by forcing her to join his fish speakers and soon he will test her as he once tested Moneo. Moneo in his youth had been placed in a massive maze concealed beneath Leto's citadel. He was given only a bag of food 
and a vial of the deadly spice essence, the Truthsayer drug, which could unblock genetic memory. It was the only liquid Leto gave him. Maneo was Atreides. He knew he would be exposed to the intermultitude upon consumption of the drug, and he feared this more than dying of thirst. He knew, however, that he had no choice. After wandering the maze for hours, he finally consumes the drug. He heard the ancestral voices and his prescient eye was open. He saw what the god emperor saw. He saw what Paul Atreides had seen and ran from those many thousands of years ago. He saw humanity's extinction and also the means by which it could be diverted, the golden path. Maneo now understood. After this, he awoke knowing the way out of the maze and knowing that he would serve the god emperor to the end of his days and he served him faithfully since that day. Maneo had been enlightened by the Golden Path. He was terrified of the idea of the world without Leto. He would rather die than face such an existence. The new Duncan, however, has begun to see Leto's rule as corruption. As he has gotten to know the world around him, he began to believe that Leto's rule of the Empire was one of religious tyranny and oppression. Idaho naturally rebelled against this. Idaho is even more disturbed upon witnessing the children of his predecessor, as well as the widow, who Duncan notices has a striking resemblance to the Lady Jessica. The God Emperor has intended to breed Siona and Duncan, and has forced them into situations where they must be together. Both Siona and Duncan resent the God Emperor for trying to control them in this manner. Siona is the key to hastening Duncan's disillusionment with the God Emperor giving him insight on the true goings-on in the Worm's empire. Duncan had been immediately attracted to the Ixian ambassador, We Nori, upon seeing her, but the God Emperor had commanded him to avoid her, saying, We is not for you. When the God Emperor decided to wed Hui Nori, Maneo voiced his own apprehensions, pointing out that this was obviously part of some Ixian plot. But Leto is in fact vulnerable. He loves Hui. Only around her does his loneliness fade. Duncan is revulsed by the thought of Leto wedding Hui. He speaks of frontiers and questions the Lord Leto on whether he would truly be free to do what he wished and go where he wished. Leto tells him that he is free to go as he chooses. I have given you my oath. That is important to me. It is still important. I don't know what you're doing or why. I can only say, I don't like what's happening. There, I said it. Leto sees Duncan as a child, and thinks to himself that Duncan is both the oldest and youngest man in the universe. Duncan disobeys the God Emperor, however, which angers him. When the God Emperor speaks to Moneo after his arrival back from the festival city, Moneo could sense the coming of the Worm. Moneo believed, truly, that there were two, Leto and the Worm. It was the Worm that killed, the Worm who was God, Leto inhabited God. Leto demands that Moneo accelerate the plans for the wedding. Moneo attempts to calm the God Emperor by stating that Nori merely feels sorry for Duncan, but Leto knows that he is courting her. He is clever with women, Moneo. Exceedingly clever. He sees into their souls and makes them do what he wants. It has always been that way with the Duncans. I did not know you had prohibited all meetings between them, Lord. Moneo's voice was almost strident. He is more dangerous than any of the others. Leto said. It is the fault of our times. Lord, the Tleilaxu do not have a successor for him ready to deliver. And we need this one? You said it yourself, Lord. It is a paradox, which I do not understand. But you did say it. How long until there can be a replacement? At least a year, Lord. Shall I inquire as to a specific date? Do it today. He may hear about it, Lord. The previous one did. I do not want it to happen this way, Moneo. I know, Lord. And I dare not speak of this to Nori, Leto said. The Duncan is not for her, yet I cannot hurt her. The last was almost a wail. Moneo stood in awed silence. Can't you see this? Leto demanded. Moneo, help me. Hui Nori and Duncan have fallen for each other, which upsets the God Emperor. He does not wish to hurt her. This makes him vulnerable. Moneo then starts to see the signs of the coming of the worm. The God Emperor's hands begin to twitch and his eyes glaze over. Moneo takes a step back, feeling exposed, 
knowing that a mere flick of the great body would kill him. I must appeal to the human in him. Maneo brings up Leto's sister Ganima. They had been wed, but not mates. He asked Leto if it would be possible for him to mate with Wee Nori, but the worm signs only intensified. Leto's hands vibrated spasmodically. In a very distant voice, he tells Maneo not to question him about possibilities. Maneo can hear that Leto is sinking further and further into that inner gate which only he could enter. Maneo slowly backed out of the room, trembling. Ah, that was the closest ever. And the paradox remained. Where did it point? What was the meaning of the God Emperor's odd and painful decisions? What brought the worm who is God? A thumping sounded from within Leto's Ari, a heavy beating against stone. Maneo dared not open the door to investigate. He pushed himself away from the surface which reflected that dreadful thumping, and went down the stairs moving cautiously, not drawing an easy breath until he reached the ground level and the fish speaker guard there. Is he disturbed? she asked, looking up the stairs. Maneo nodded. They both could hear the thumping quite plainly. What disturbs him? the guard asked. He is God, and we are mortal, Maneo said. Duncan has put them all in danger, and Maneo cannot help but resent him even more. He wonders what can be done about Hui Nori. Maneo goes to Duncan and tells him of the God Emperor's wishes. His relationship with Hui Nori cannot continue. It only angers Duncan more. Maneo sees now that this Duncan is more reckless than any of the others before him, and insists that he must trust the God Emperor. But the Duncan says aloud, how can a god do evil things? The fish speaker women in the room without a doubt heard this and would make their reports to the Lord Leto. Had it been any other man other than Duncan Idaho who spoke those words, the women themselves would have eliminated him. Duncan becomes paranoid and wonders what the god emperor will do, but in his chambers he finds Wee Nori there. She had been told to reject Duncan. As Duncan looks at her, he is reminded of the controlled movements of the Lady Jessica and realizes that Hui Nori is Bene Gesserit trained. The Bene Gesserit were indeed among her teachers, though she is not a member of the Sisterhood. Hui cannot deny her attraction to Duncan, though the God Emperor forbids it. She admits to Duncan that she was bred and trained for one purpose alone, to woo the God Emperor. She was designed to please an Atreides, and Duncan had always truly been Atreides. Hui and Duncan make love then, but afterwards she tells him that they never will again be together in this way. She tells him that she will tell the God Emperor of what they have done. She knows that Leto will not harm her, and he will not harm the Duncan, for this would destroy her in turn. Hui truly understands that Leto needs her more than Duncan, though Duncan argues. He only resents Leto even more. Finally, Leto and Siona meet. He summons her to him. She asks him if he is really a god, she does not understand why her father Maneo believes in him, but he does not necessarily answer her. She asks why he has done what he has done, why he has chosen to become this monstrosity, but he does not directly answer. Gradually as they spoke, Leto had been dimming the concealed lights of his airy, moving his cart closer and closer to Siona. Now he shut off the lights, leaving only the moon. The front of his cart protruded onto the balcony, his face about two meters from Siona. My father tells me, she said, that the older you get, the slower your time goes. Is that what you told him? Testing my veracity, he thought. She is not a truth singer then. All things are relative, but compared to the human time sense, this is true. Why? It is involved in what I will become. At the end time will stop for me, and I will be frozen like a pearl caught in ice. My new bodies will scatter, each with a pearl hidden within it." She turned and looked away from him, peering out at the desert, speaking without looking at him. When I talk to you like this, here in the darkness, I can almost forget what you are. When Siona asks Leto to turn on the lights, she wonders why his face is not wrinkled. He tells her that nothing about his human parts age in a normal way. She wonders if he did this for long life, but he assures her that he did not. He tells her the truth about his metamorphosis. 
that since she is Atreides, she could too be like him if there were other sand trout around. The thought of it makes her shiver, but she knows that it is the truth. Once again she asked why, but he said that she will know in time. Leto tells Siona of his secret, the secret that she already knows. He tells her of the companions that he has loved that have slipped away from him, of her mother who slipped away long ago, and her father who is slipping away now. He is racked with emotion each time. For many centuries, this suffering was the only emotion he knew. Siona sympathizes with the God Emperor, but insists that this does not give him the right to govern, and Leto knew this was the root of her rebellion. By what right? Where is the justice in my rule? By imposing my rules upon them, with the weight of fish speaker arms, am I being fair to the evolutionary thrust of mankind? As intended, Leto's conversation with Siona leaves her wide open to her own doubts. She still insists that she had not been convinced of anything by their meeting. She asks what the purpose of it was. He tells her that the purpose is to see if she was ready to be tested, which obviously frightens her. Don't play innocent with me. Maneo has told you, and I tell you that you are ready. She tried to swallow then. What are... I have sent for Maneo to return you to the Citadel, he said. When we meet again, we will really learn what you are made of. When the God Emperor next speaks to Maneo, he asks how soon the Tleilaxu can provide a replacement Duncan. Maneo tells him that the Tleilaxu report problems. Maneo believes that the worm may soon approach. The God Emperor grows increasingly agitated with the behavior of the current Duncan. His subversion was occurring far more quickly than anticipated. Maneo was aware of the many deaths that had occurred in the crypts in which they resided. He wonders, judging by the way the God Emperor is speaking, if it is his time to die. Failure to respond to the God Emperor correctly, he believed, would mean his death. Abruptly, Leto's voice filled the chamber with a rumbling baritone, an ancient voice which spoke across the centuries. You are servants unto gods, not servants unto servants! Maneo wrung his hands out and cried, I serve you, Lord! Maneo! Maneo! His voice low and resonant. A million wrongs cannot give rise to one right. The right is known because it endures. Maneo could only stand in trembling silence. I had intended we to mate with you, Maneo, Leto said. Now it is too late. The words took a moment, penetrating Maneo's consciousness. He felt that their meaning was out of any known context. We? Who was we? Oh yes, the God Emperor's Ixian bride-to-be. Mate? With me? Maneo shook his head. Leto spoke with infinite sadness. You too shall pass away. Will all of your works be as dust, forgotten? Without any warning, even as he spoke, Leto's body convulsed in a thrashing roll which heaved him from the cart. The speed of it, the monstrous violence, threw him within centimeters of Maneo who screamed and fled across the crypt. Maneo! Leto's call stopped the major domo at the entrance to the lift. The test, Maneo! I will test Siona tomorrow. Siona asks her father about the test. She asks him what will happen to her. He tells her that each test is different. Leto had listened to them secretly through his Ixian devices, as Maneo dressed his daughter in a traditional Fremen still suit. He told her that the worm would come, and that she must find a way to live in his presence. He explained the still suit to her and how it worked and told her that she must go, but that she may not return. Leto brings Siona into his desert, the only desert remaining on the planet Arrakis. The isolated desert climate was maintained by Ixian devices. Leto could move swiftly in his own territory. It was his domain. They look out onto the desert together. This was how it was, he said. He knew that there was something in the desert that spoke to the eternal soul of those who possessed Fremen blood. He tells Siona to climb upon his back. I want you to taste the way our people once moved proudly across this land, high atop the back of a giant sandworm. Leto knows that Siona still has no idea how he intends to test her. He knew that he must have no pity. He leads them both deeper into the desert. He sensed it when Siona began to enjoy the sensation of riding on his back. He felt a faint shift in her weight as she eased back onto her legs to lift her head. He drove outward, 
then along the curving barricade, joining Siona in enjoyment of the old sensations. Once he tells her to come down, she is distrustful. She is afraid that he will leave her there. He tells her that they have traveled 60 kilometers. He tells her that now that she has felt her past, she must be sensitized to her future. He has brought her to the center of the desert. He tells her that they will walk out of the desert together. She only has a small pouch of food to sustain her. He tells her that they will travel by night in the traditional Fremen way. Meanwhile, Idaho has sought out Maneo and angrily demands to know where Leto is. I'll find him, Maneo. Not right now. Idaho put a hand on his knife. Do I have to use force to make you talk? I would not advise that. Where is he? Since you insist, he is out in the desert with Siona. With your daughter? Is there another Siona? What are they doing? She is being tested. When will they return? Maneo shrugged. Then, why this unseemly anger, Duncan? What's this test of your... I don't know. Now, why are you so upset? I'm sick of this place. Fish speakers. Duncan had glimpsed two fish speaker women joined together in a kiss. This disturbed his archaic sensibilities. Maneo said, It is perfectly normal for adolescent females as well as males to have feelings of physical attraction toward members of their own sex. Most of them will grow out of it. It should be stamped out. But it's part of our heritage. Idaho insists that this rampant homosexuality must be suppressed. But wiser Maneo understood that an attempt to suppress such a thing only increases its power. Idaho shifts the conversation to the topic of Siona and attempts to shame Maneo for allowing the worm to test her, knowing that she may never return. Maneo wonders to himself why he puts up with such a foolish person as Duncan Idaho, and he responds that he had no choice. He insists to Duncan Idaho that he must mature. I am not some damn child you can- Duncan! It was the loudest sound Idaho had ever heard from the mild-mannered Maneo. Surprise stayed Idaho's hand while Maneo continued. If the demands of your flesh are for maturity, but something holds you in adolescence, quite nasty behavior develops. Let go. Are you accusing me of- No! Maneo gestured at the corridor. Oh, I know what you must have seen back there, but it- Two women? In a passionate kiss? You think that's not... It's not important. Youth explores potential in many ways. Idaho balanced himself on the edge of an explosion, rocking forward on his toes. I'm glad to learn about you, Maneo. Yes. Well, I've learned about you several times. Maneo watched the effect of these words as they twisted through Idaho, tangling him. The Golas could never avoid a fascination with the others who had preceded them. Idaho spoke in a hoarse whisper. What have you learned? You have taught me valuable things, Maneo said. All of us try to evolve, but if something blocks us, we can transfer our potential into pain seeking it or giving it. Adolescents are particularly vulnerable. Idaho leaned close to Maneo. I'm talking about sex. Of course you are. Are you accusing me of adolescent? That's right. I should cut your- Oh, shut up! Maneo's response did not have the training nuances of Benny Jesuit voice control, but it had a lifetime of command behind it. Something in Idaho could only obey. I'm sorry, Maneo said, but I am distracted by the fact that my only daughter- He broke off and shrugged. Idaho inhaled two deep breaths. You're crazy. All of you. You say your daughter may be dying and yet- You fool! Maneo snapped. Have you any idea how your petty concerns appear to me? Your stupid questions and your selfish... He broke off, shaking his head. I make allowances because you have certain problems, Idaho said. But if you... Allowances? You make allowances. Maneo took a trembling breath. It was too much. Idaho spoke stiffly. I can forgive you for... You? You prattle about sex and forgiving and pain, and you think you and we, Nori, leave her out of this. Oh yes, leave her out. Leave out that pain. You share sex with her and you never think about parting. Tell me, fool, how do you give of yourself in the face of that? Abashed, Idaho inhaled deeply. He had not suspected such passion smoldering in the quiet Maneo. But this attack, this could not be. You think I'm cruel? Maneo demanded. 
I make you think of things you'd rather avoid. Ha! Huh. Crueler things have been done to the Lord Leto for no better reason than the cruelty. You defend him. You... I know him best. He uses you. To what ends? You tell me. He is our best hope to perpetuate. Perverts do not perpetuate. Moneo spoke in a soothing tone, but his words shook Idaho. I will tell you this only once. Homosexuals have been among the best warriors in our history. The berserkers of last resort. They were among our best priests and priestesses. Celibacy was no accident in religions. Maneo attempts to guide Duncan out of his backward viewpoint, but Duncan resists at every turn, constantly questing for something else to hate about Leto's empire. You suggested that he uses me, Maneo said. I permit this because I know the price that he pays is much greater than what he demands of me. Even your daughter. He holds back nothing. Why should I? Oh, I think you understand this about the Atreides. The Duncans are always good at that. The Duncans, damn you, I won't be. You just haven't the guts to pay the price he's asking, Maneo said. In one blurred motion, Idaho whipped his knife from its sheath and lunged at Maneo. As fast as he moved, Maneo moved faster, sidestepping, tripping Idaho and propelling him face down on the floor. Idaho scrambled forward, rolled and started to leap to his feet, then hesitated, realizing that he had actually tried to attack an Atreides. Maneo was Atreides. Shock held Idaho immobile. Maneo stood unmoving, looking down at him. There was an odd look of sadness on the Major Domo's face. If you are going to kill me, Duncan, You'd best do it in the back, by stealth, Maneo said. You might succeed that way. Idaho levered himself to one knee, put a foot flat on the floor, but remained there still clutching his knife. Maneo had moved so quickly, and with such grace, so, so casually. Idaho cleared his throat. How did you? He has been breeding us for a long time, Duncan, strengthening many things in us. He has bred us for speed, for intelligence, for self-restraint, for sensitivity. You're, you're just an older model. The tension that had been building between Duncan and Maneo finally comes to a peak in this scene, when Duncan Idaho attacks Maneo, but then is met with the shock of Maneo's incredible agility and speed. Duncan Idaho is nothing compared to thousands of years of precise genetic honing. After this, Idaho's self-esteem drops. He begins to see himself as obsolete and wonders if he should kill himself. He only resents Leto even more. Maneo's words echoed in his mind. You're just an older model. As Leto and Siona moved through the desert, they spoke sporadically. He told her of Fremen history, and in the afternoon, she crept close to him for the warmth his body generated in excess. Leto noticed that Siona was not utilizing the face flap in her still suit. This would cause the body to lose moisture much faster, but he could not intervene. It was part of the test. As their time in the desert continues, Siona grows weaker. She leaned against him once and heard the rumbling of his insides. Leto saw that she was cold. He allowed her to curl up inside a depression at the bottom of his first segment in order to keep warm. Leto knew that he had to resist feeling pity for Siona, since knowing Hui Nori, his human emotions had become more amplified than they had been in centuries. Siona inched closer to death as time went on. Leto prepared himself for her failure, and considered her replacement. Once Leto had made callous decisions with ease, but as he grew increasingly inhuman, he found himself to be consumed with increasingly more human concerns. It was only on the third day that Siona remembered Maneo's explanation of the still suit. By this point, however, Siona had lost a considerable amount of water. Five days in, Leto can sense Siona's desperation and knows that she will soon reach a moment of crisis. He tells her that there are three nights until they find water. She knows that she will not make it. Once again, she asks why he does what he does. He tells her truthfully that he has a need to save the threads of all humankind. He says that without him, by this point in history, all of humankind would already be extinct, and the path to that extinction 
would have been more hideous than she could have ever possibly imagined. He assures her that the two of them are in fact interdependent, and when she asks what need he has of her, he responds by saying this, You are the golden path, he said. Me? It was barely a whisper. You've read those journals you stole from me, he said. I am in them, but where are you? Look at what I have created, Siona. And you, you can create nothing except yourself. Words, more tricky words. I do not suffer from being worshipped, Siona. I suffer from never being appreciated. Perhaps, no, I dare not hope for you. What's the purpose of those journals? An Ixian machine records them. They are to be found on a faraway day. They will make people think. An Ixian machine? You defy the Jihad! There is a lesson in that too. What do such machines really do? They increase the number of things we can do without thinking. Things we do without thinking. There's the real danger. Look at how long you walked across this desert without thinking about your face mask. You could have warned me. And increased your dependency. Siona still does not yet understand what Leto means in insisting that she is the golden path but she is shocked by his admission to defying the Butlerian Jihad. He tells her that it is not the machines that are the danger, but the thoughtless things that humans can do using those machines. In truth, Leto fears the Ixians, knowing that they can invent catastrophe. Leto knew that all of history was a race between invention and catastrophe. Siona asks what she must do for him in order to save her, he tells her that she must undergo the spice agony. And she knows what the spice will do to her, considering her attrayed these blood. These curled flaps beside my face, he said. Tease one of them gently with a finger, and it will give up drops of moisture heavily laced with the spice essence. Siona leaned towards him and licked the drops off his flap and resealed the still suit mask over her eyes. She refitted herself into Leto's front segment. She jerked abruptly and began to tremble like a small creature dying. He knew this experience, but could not change the smallest part of it. No ancestral presences would remain in her consciousness, but she would carry with her forever afterward the clear sights and sounds and smells. The seeking machines would be there, the smell of blood and entrails, the cowering humans in their burrows aware that they could not escape while all the time the mechanical movement approached, nearer and nearer and nearer, louder and louder. Leto could feel Siona's life ebbing. He could feel the vitality draining out of her, slipping away. She was falling into darkness. Leto rocked her gently like a baby in a cradle. Eventually the trembling subsided. Siona awoke late afternoon and did not speak for an hour. Turning her back on Leto, she had seen everything. You could have saved my friends in the forest, she accused. You too could have saved them. She clenched her fist and pressed them against her temples while she glared at him. But you know everything, Siona. Did I have to learn it that way, she whispered. He remained silent, forcing her to answer the question for herself. She had to be made to recognize that his primary consciousness worked in a Fremen way, and that, like the terrible machines of that apocalyptic vision, the Predator could follow any creature who left tracks. The Golden Path, she whispered. I can feel it. Then, glaring at him, It's so cruel. Survival has always been cruel. They couldn't hide, she whispered. Then loud, what have you done to me? You tried to be a Fremen rebel, he said. Fremen had an almost incredible ability to read signs on the desert. They could even read the faint tracery of wind-blown tracks in sand. Leto muses about what they had seen in the vision. The machines that would hunt and kill any living creature who left tracks. Siona and her descendants would leave no tracks. Siona saw the golden path, saw what it prevented, she saw the thing that humans could not hide from, 
the thing that would hunt and kill every living thing in the universe. Siona still hates Leto, however, and she has realized that he cannot find her in his prescient view. He tells her that she hates the Predator's necessary cruelty. He tells her that she must breed and preserve her precious genes. As Leto spoke, a sudden bout of rain covered them for an instant, a malfunction of his Ixian weather machines. Siona did not immediately notice the effect it had on Leto. He curled into a ball of agony, felt as though he was being ripped apart. Blue smoke drifted from his body as he involuntarily began to produce true spice essence, not the altered form that he had used to test Siona, which did not allow her to retain genetic memory. Siona realizes that the water hurts him. He tells her about the relationship of sand trout to water. In that moment, Leto could see that there was still rebellion in her eyes. She could not deny the reality of his golden path, but in her mind, his cruelties could not be forgiven. He knows what Siona is thinking, but will do nothing against her. She must live. After their return from the desert, Leto makes Siona a guard commander. Still, she plots his destruction, and now Duncan Idaho plots along with her. And now that Siona knows the secret of the God Emperor's demise, ring him with water, she is certain that she can kill him. Siona says that she will not break her oath, that she will command his fish speakers, but it will not be as he wishes, or so she thought. Siona was Atreides, and she opposed the God Emperor, so Duncan was justified. Leto was no true human after all. Siona was a real Atreides. Together, they plot the murder of the God Emperor. Nela, who has sworn to obey Siona in all things, has no choice but to help, knowing that her god will perform a miracle. The god emperor grows increasingly agitated as his wedding draws nearer. Only Hui Nori seems to calm him. I have no inner eye, no inner voices, she said, but I have seen my lord Leto, whose soul I love, and I know the only thing that you truly understand. He broke from her gaze, fearful of what she might say. The trembling of his hands could be felt all through his front segment. Love, that is what you understand, she said. Love, and that is all of it. His hands stopped trembling. A tear rolled down each of his cheeks. When the tears touched his cowl, wisp of blue smoke erupted. He sensed the burning and was thankful for the pain. The Ixians had intended for Leto to love Wee, but not for her to love him. That was beyond their planning. Leto sheds a tear in this scene, a thing which he had previously believed was impossible. Leto was more inhuman than he had ever been before. Wee offered him an opportunity to restore his humanity for one final fleeting moment. As the royal cart carrying the god emperor and Wee Nori crosses the bridge leading into Tuano village, Maneo heard the laser gun. It was Nela who had fired from the cliffs at the command of Siona. Maneo felt the bridge shake underneath him. He saw the god emperor's cart lean over the edge of the bridge. Wee Nori fell silently to her death. Her last words echoed in Leto's mind. I shall go on ahead, love. A deep, rumbling groan had come from Leto then. And in that moment, another laser gun blast hit, directly striking the royal cart's suspensors. As Maneo fell, he reaches a final point of awareness, the clarity of mind that one experiences before death. As he plunges to his death, he turns to see Leto fall from the royal cart. He shouted, Leto! See a nook! I believe! He fell freely then, in the ecstasy of awareness. As Leto fell toward the river beneath, he thought to himself, Now you will learn. It is time for humanity to know his final lesson. Leto fell into pure agony. He marveled that he could remain conscious through such incredible pain. He could feel himself separating as the sand trout of his body detached from him and went into the water. They would eventually emerge as a new breed of worms. Spice in the future will be more difficult to harvest, for each worm 
would have a piece of the God Emperor inside, a fragmentation of his whole self. Puffs of blue smoke and mist rise all around him as his body produces the spice essence. Somehow, he pulls himself from the water. He recognizes the place then. Just down the barrier wall was the remains of Siege Tabor, where he had hidden his immense hoard of spice. He turned in the confinement of the cave and saw a rope dangling at the entrance. A figure slid down the rope. He recognized Nayla. She dropped to the rocks and crouched there, staring into the shadows at him. The flame which was Leto's vision parted to reveal another figure dropping from the rope. Siona. She and Nayla scrambled toward him in a rattle of rocks and stopped, peering at him. A third figure dropped off the rope. Idaho. He moved with a frantic rage, hurling himself at Nayla, screaming, Why'd you kill her? You weren't supposed to kill we! Nayla sent him sprawling with a casual, almost indifferent sweep of her left arm. She scrambled up closer to the rocks and stopped on all fours to peer at Leto. Lord, you live? Idaho was right behind her, snatching the laser gun from her holster. Nayla turned, astonished, as he leveled the weapon and pulled the trigger. The burning started at the top of Nayla's head. It split her, the pieces slumping apart. Siona and Duncan gaze upon Leto. The sand trout skin had fled into the water. He was pocked with cilia holes from where they had left. He was a disgusting sludge. Look at what you've done to poor Duncan, Leto said. He'll find other loves. How callous she sounded, an echo of his own angry youth. You do not know what love is, he said. What have you ever given? He could only wring his hands then, those travesties which once had been his hands. Gods below what I've given. She slid closer and reached toward him, then drew back. I am reality, Siona. Look upon me. I exist. You can touch me if you dare. Reach out your hand. Do it. Slowly, she reached toward what had been his front segment, the place where she had slept in the surreal. Her hand was touched with blue when she withdrew it. You have touched me and felt my body, he said. Is that not strange beyond any other thing in this universe? She started to turn away. No, don't turn away from me. Look at what you have wrought, Siona. How is it that you can touch me, but you cannot touch yourself? She whirled away from him. There is the difference between us, he said. You are God embodied. You walk around with the greatest miracle of this universe. Yet you refuse to touch, or see, or feel, or believe in it. As Leto died, he could sense his Ixian devices working, recording his thoughts on Redulian crystals. Leto thinks to his journals, Remember what I did. Remember me. I will be innocent again. The journals will be his record of the truth, the version undistorted by history. He says to Duncan, Let them scatter. Let them run and hide anywhere they want in any universe they choose. Referencing the great scattering of mankind that will occur following his death, he tells Duncan that the fish speakers will choose to follow him over Siona. He asks Duncan to be kind to her. He tells him that Siona is more than Atreides, and that she carries the seed of the survival of all humans. Leto tells Siona and Duncan where his spice hoard is hidden. Duncan knows the place. One final time, Duncan asks why. Why has Leto done any of this? Leto answers. My gift, Leto said. Nobody will find the descendants of Siona. The Oracle cannot see her. What? They spoke in unison, leaning close to hear his fading voice. I give you a new kind of time. Without parallels, he said. It will always diverge. There will be no concurrent points on its curves. I give you the golden path. That is my gift. Never again will you have the kinds of concurrence that once you had. Leto dies as his consciousness is fragmented, and the gross hulk that was his body disintegrates into puddles of blue mist. Siona tells Duncan that though she is different, she is still what Leto was. She walked amongst her inner lives, but was unseen 
and could only glimpse blurred shapes of her ancestral past, enough to light the golden path. You know the myth of the Great Spice Horde. Yes, I know about that story too. The Major Domo brought it to me one day to amuse me. The story says there is a horde of Melange, a gigantic horde, big as a great mountain. The horde is concealed in the depths of a distant planet. It is not Arrakis, that planet. It is not Dune. The spice was hidden there long ago, even before the First Empire and the Spacing Guild. The story says that Paul Muad'Dib went there and lives yet beside the Horde, kept alive by it, waiting. The Major Domo did not understand why the story disturbed me. The story of the Great Spice Horde may have disturbed the God Emperor for several reasons. In some sense, Paul did live on, kept alive by a giant Spice Horde. Muad'Dib still lived within the Hordes of Leto's mind, eternally observing. The story may also disturb Leto because it represents the very thing he was trying to destroy. The story indicated that humankind still longed for their messiah, their savior who would solve their problems and restore the empire to the way it once was. This mentality was incompatible with the golden path. But what is the golden path exactly? It starts with one basic idea. If one individual could rule over all mankind, then one threat could destroy it. This is the essential lesson that he had to teach mankind. Centralized leaders must be avoided at all cost. He became the greatest despot of all time, so that humans would always remember and never return to their past behaviors. There is more. Leto saw the death of all humankind if he did not intervene. In the stolen journals, Leto muses to himself, and who knows what the Ixians might manufacture or invent? Who knows? I certainly don't. Not all of it. Leto understood that once the magic of technology was unleashed, that it could never be put back in the box. The Ixians had tried to hide a colony beyond his vision. It had failed. He tolerated the Ixians, though he called them criminals of science. The Ixians operated in the terra incognita of creative invention, which had been outlawed by the Butlerian Jihad. They made their devices in the image of the mind, the very thing which had ignited the Jihad's destruction and slaughter. That was what they did on Ix, and Leto could only let them continue. But Leto knew that he would not have to worry as long as he succeeded in his breeding program. Once he knew that Siona was the one, he no longer feared what the Ixians would create. His final words to Duncan and Siona are, do not fear the Ixians. They can make the machines, but they can no longer make Arafel. I know I was there. Arafel is the cloud darkness of holy judgment. This is a biblical reference. Psalm 97 2. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and justice are the habitation of his throne. Essentially, Leto was saying that though the Ixians will continue to invent, they will never create God, never create a machine that will be the final judge of all humankind. Siona solved this problem. Whatever threat that Leto foresaw would have used prescience to seek out and destroy all of mankind. Siona's genes, which spread throughout all the universe during the scattering, would prevent this. By forcing mankind to stagnate, confined to their individual planets for thousands of years, Leto created a restlessness within them. When they were free from his tyranny, they scattered throughout the universe. The Ixian threat would never be able to find all humans. No one individual could ever again glimpse the whole of humanity. No machine can do as we do. The descendants of Duncan, Idaho, and Siona have done. How many universes have we populated? None can guess. No one person will ever know. Does the church fear the occasional prophet? We know that visionaries cannot see us nor predict our decisions. No death can find all of humankind. 
Must we of the minority join our fellows of the scattering before we can be heard? Must we leave the original core of humankind ignorant and uninformed? If the majority drives us out, you know we never again can be found. We do not want to leave. We are held here by those pearls in the sand. We are fascinated by the church's use of the pearl as the sun of understanding. Surely no reasoning human can escape the journal's revelations in this regard. The admittedly fugitive but vital uses of archaeology must have their day, just as the primitive machine which Leto concealed his journals can only teach us about the evolution of our machines. Just so, that ancient awareness must be allowed to speak to us. It would be a crime against both historical accuracy and science for us to abandon our attempts at communication with those pearls of awareness, which the journals have located. Is Leto II lost in his endless dream, or could he be reawakened to our times, brought to full consciousness as a storehouse of historical accuracy? How can Holy Church fear this truth? For the minority, we have no doubt that historians must listen to that voice from our many beginnings. If it is only the journals, we must listen. We must listen across at least as many years into our future as those journals lay hidden in our past. We will not try to predict the discoveries yet to be made within those pages. We say only that they must be made. How can we turn our backs on our most important inheritance? As the poet Lon Bromless said, We are the fountain of surprises. I hope you all have enjoyed episode 5 of my Ultimate Guide to Dune series. In the next episode, we will cover Heretics of Dune, the fifth book in Frank Herbert's classic Dune saga. If you would like to support this channel, consider pledging a dollar or two on Patreon. 